Okay, so we're going to sing a few songs together, beginning with uh, the Lord's Mercy. Mm -hmm. Worship is holy. 
so the reading is Agai chapter two, verses one to nine. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Agai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jostak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you, do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. I will confess last evening. Uh, feeling a little bit uh, disheartened. And I was thinking about these, some of these words that we just read, that Peter just read to us. I was thinking about them like this. Who of you is left who saw this CEC church weekend away in its former glory? <laughs> How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? I didn't think there was nothing. So. <laughs> but there's so few people here compared to three years ago, five years ago. A little bit disheartened. But then I went and looked at the rest of this passage. But now be strong. Be strong, the Lord said. For I am with you. It's always impressed me on how many times in the Bible we read. Those, those words, I am with you. So let's pray. Lord God, Almighty, Almighty Lord, Lord of hosts, Maker of heaven and earth, Holy God, we bow before you this morning. As we read these words together, I am with you. Your humble Lord, to read these words, we're humble to look at this passage, these passages together. We have no right to criticize these people. I think we would have done anything different because we're all sinners just like they were. We all neglect the priority like they did. <coughs> Lord God, we thank you that this morning as we come before you, we thank you that we stand in the light of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. The one who loved us and gave himself for us. The one who gave himself for his church. And he might present her to himself. Oh me. For God, we can't stand before you unless we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless we come on the basis of what he's done for us through his death on the cross, through his shed blood, dealing with our sin, 
A father on the basis of that become in confidence. Before you this morning, we come to not only read your word, but to think about it together. And not only just to think about it, but to put it into practice. And once again, Lord, we pray for your help and my joy as he brings your word to us now. You will empower him by your Holy Spirit. Give him freedom to speak your words, we pray. And may we be like these people and obey the voice of the Lord our God. Because you have sent Nigel to speak to us, and because we fear you, your almighty living God. Amen. Amen. Well, as you can see, Annette's had enough. She's gone, but you have to stay. Sorry. But she's had to go back to the funeral, unfortunately. This afternoon, so she will be back this evening. Um, I just thought in that last hymn, I thought there were two great examples of, of, of things that I like to pick up on, so I'm going to go back. This is the first one. Imagine if you put the first line only on your fridge. <laughs> imagine, if you took, imagine if you took that out of context. Let's all sing that with gusto. My sin, oh, the bliss of thy glorious thought. No, you've got to carry on, haven't you? you? You really got to read the rest, otherwise it gets really dodgy, but let's not go there. And the next one is explaining to people who have not been in the church for 20, 30, 50 years, that second line, if Jordan above me shall roll. Now, for me, being a basketball fan and being the age I am, I can just think of Michael Jordan, I'm trying to guard him, and he whips past me and does a 360 and backward dunk. You don't know what that is, but that's fine. But that's all I would think of. That's talking about when we're going to die. Okay, that's a, that's what it means. But it's just always important, isn't it? We've got to we've got to think of who are we speaking to. You know, if you go to someone that ah, if Jordan above you shall roll, you go what? You know, they're not really going to get what you said. So sorry about that. A bit of an aside. Haggai, prosperity and peace. So we've got in the year 538, the people allowed to return under Zerubbabel and Joshua. And two years later, they start work on this destroyed temple. And remember the sort of mindset people are in? Mum and dad have told me about this place. It's wonderful. I've never seen it. I was born, I was born in Babylon or, or, or Persia. And, and they've said it's a massive temple and it's massive city walls. And it's, oh, it's, oh my word, what a dump. That's how the people felt. So two years later, they start work on the temple. We managed to stick an altar up and the foundation stone, and it takes them two years. Then after that, they say, well, this isn't going very well, is it? So they give up. 14 years later, Haggai turns up. He's been there all the time. Has God been silent? Has the people not been listening? We don't know. But 14 years later, he turns up with four messages in four months. And so God speaks by Haggai, via Haggai, and he says, you're running after earthly things. And however hard you try, it's not working. It doesn't fill the hole in your soul. Why? Because the hole in your soul is God-shaped. And however hard we try and cram other things in it, money, sex, power, those are the three big ones for males at least. However hard we try and cram those things in that hole, the only thing that will actually fill that hole is God himself. So God says, turn to me. Do what you're designed to do. Worship me. Make me your one priority. And the people turn to God. And God immediately says four words, I am with you. And then we come to the problem of the good old days. Have you ever heard that? Probably oh, just heard it, didn't we? It's interesting. How we wish we could go back to the good old days. You know what they say? Nostalgia isn't what it used to be. <laughs> oh, we used to say the good old days are good old days are a lot more than the good old days, didn't we? <laughs> and it's lovely because God knows what is happening here. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what others of you are feeling. Oh, the good old temple. 
was far better. The stories mum and dad used to tell me of the celebrations that went on in that place. It was bigger. It could fit more people. It had more gold, etc., etc., etc. And wonderfully in this passage, God preempts those feelings. You see, he knows what is going to be said. And he knows how the church in the UK in 2021 feels. And he preempts them 2,541 years ago. And so we come to the passage in question, Haggai 2, verses 1 to 9. If you have your Bibles open, that would be great. Don't worry if you don't. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. So that's the 17th of October, 520 BC. Again, the word Lord came by or through or via Haggai. Again, like I said this morning, we must be channels for God's messages, both to those in the church and those outside the church. And then how does it go on? Verses two and three. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. See, he may have heard from his dad, who'd heard from his granddad, because his granddad was king of Judah, Jehoiakim, the last king. And Jehoiakim may have sat, I don't know, actually, I don't know my history well enough. Did he die when, when Jerusalem was sacked? I can't remember. He was probably taken <coughs> off into uh, captivity, but I'm not entirely sure. But someone probably sat as a rabbi on their knee and said, oh, if only you'd seen Jerusalem. He'd say, yeah. And Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest, imagine, he was from a line of high priests. So his granddad or great granddad or whoever, had been the high priest, most probably. And he would have told him about the temple. Oh, my <laughs> word, what days they were. And they say, and God says, ask them, ask the people, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Compare it. Does it not seem to you like nothing? God was preempting what the people were feeling. And I think that's wonderful. He knows what you feel. He knows how you feel. And I do believe it's a sentiment that is felt by many of the church. This discouragement of what the church used to be like. And it's important that I say this, please forgive me. That is not of God. I say it, so I'm not getting at anyone, I promise. But it is not of God. He understands it. He understands how you feel. But please don't think that that attitude actually helps. You see, we can get to the stage of feeling so downtrodden and so helpless that we're in danger of forgetting the war is already won. Now I'm getting goose pimples. You may not because you're not speaking. But I'm getting goose pimples when I say that because I so often forget it. The war is won. On the April, April the 20th, 1999, a terrible event happened in Columbine. Some of you will remember this. Uh, two students went into a high school. I didn't realize it until a couple of weeks ago when I was looking at this. Uh, they'd actually intended to blow up the school. So they prepared two propane bombs and the bombs didn't go off because what they wanted to do is they wanted to become famous by killing more people than Timothy McVeigh had done when he blew up that building and killed so many people in the US. So that was their goal. But when the bombs didn't go off, they thought, okay, the next best thing is, because the plan was the bombs go off, kill many people. As the students and teachers are running out, they would pick them off in the car park. That was why they had guns with them, not actually to go in. In the end, they went in, killed 10 students, one teacher, and then shot themselves. And most of the students died in the library. I'm sure some of you know this story. And this is showing my age. Michael W. Smith used to be, in the good old days, he used to be a, 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 a singer, an American Christian singer. And he wrote a song uh, about one of the students in that school. Now, what's interesting is it's, it's, it's become a bit of folklore about what this girl, Cassie Bernal, actually did. She was a Christian and she was shot. 
in the face with a shotgun by one of these boys and died. There are other things that are claimed she had said, and it's not true. It was actually said by another Christian student when, when um, she was shot and she was pleading because she was a Christian, she was praying, and the, um, and the gunman uh, pointed his gun and said, God, you believe in God? And the girl said, yes. And amazingly, the next shot did not kill her and she's still alive. So look it up. It's an interesting story. But Cassie Bernal, who was a Christian, was shot and killed. And Michael W. Smith wrote the song for her parents. And it's called This Is Your Time. Listen to it. It's a very powerful song. But a few of the lines go like this. This is written to her parents, remember. She was only 17 years old. She'd had problems with drink and drugs before, but had come back to the Lord. And it was wonderful, really. But this is what he said to her parents. Um, Though you are mourning and grieving your loss, death died a long time ago. Swallowed in life, so her life carries on. And I think that's something we tend to forget. I'm going to read some words from 1 Corinthians 15, very famous words. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The war has already been won. And we need to somehow stop being discouraged and look to the future and look to God. Because interestingly, 1 Corinthians, when you think of it, it was being written to a group of Christians in Corinth, probably a lot less than are in this room at the moment, in a far more salubrious surroundings, probably in someone's basement, worried that they were going to get arrested at any point. I wonder whether they were saying, oh, the good old days. Prosperity. The first thing I'd like to look at, if you follow from verse, verses four and five. Now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now, there's something between brackets that I want to say about verse 5. <clears throat> Notice what it says here. He's talking to Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the people in 520 BC. And he says, this is what I covenanted with you when? When you came out of Egypt. Whoa, hang on. We didn't come out of Egypt. That was years and years and years. And do you understand that God is the same God? So when we talk about the good old days, the, the danger is what we do is we say, God has changed. We get to the stage of feeling so downtrodden and so depressed about numbers and so, and so on and so on that we start equating that with God's difference. And it's wonderful when we come back and realize that the same God that is in this room today by his Holy Spirit, because we have met in Jesus's name. I'm trying to be very accurate there. We often say Jesus is with us. He is in the sense that his spirit is with us. We have to be careful about that. The same God who is in this room by his spirit, because we have met in Jesus's name, is the same God who brought the people out of Egypt and is the same God who raised Jesus from the dead. And when we grasp that, it becomes very powerful. But 
back to what I was talking about. Notice what it says here. Be strong. Work. Do not fear. For I am with you. My spirit remains with you. You see, this is what real prosperity is. If we want to define prosperity, we have two choices. We can either look at what the world defines as prosperity or what the Bible defines as prosperity. And the two are completely different. And the problem with the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel that has been so prevalent in the last 30, 40 years, is the church has attempted to bring those two together and say, God talks of prosperity and this is what prosperity is. So let's put them together. And if you give me a hundred dollars, you'll get 300 back. Have you ever heard that? I've literally heard that someone say that in the name of God, they said, if you donate, then you will get back two, three, four thousand dollars. Literally, it's been said. And what we need to do is we need to say, no, we need to try and understand what real prosperity is, the prosperity that God promises, and then we'll understand it better. And that prosperity is his presence. God's presence, which we spoke of earlier today, is the prosperity that God speaks of. And then let's look at verses 6 and onwards. Verse 6, this is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. God's timing. In a little while. Right, so what's that? A couple of minutes? I'll get your coffee in a little while. Well, if Annette hasn't got it to me by in 30 seconds, I'm huffing and puffing. Honestly, I, honestly, I, I may look like the perfect husband. <laughs> I could be a, there's a word for it, but I wouldn't say it, a git. I really can sometimes. Done, would you like coffee? Yeah, I'll have a coffee. And I'm sat at my desk. Five minutes. Six months, and I'm there, and I make noise. You know when you make, you know how you can make noise switching your headphone? Clack! It's not just on. It's, are you there? Look at this. <laughs> Why? Because timing is a strange thing. Timing is a strange thing. God's timing. I mean, we. It wouldn't it be better if we were God? Honestly, wouldn't we do it better? You know, in a little while, God. Seriously, ten minutes, please. I was talking with Ian last night, the greatest example of context in the Bible, the greatest fridge magnet in the world is Jeremiah 29, 11. We all know it, don't we? Oh, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper. Oh, it's wonderful. Have you ever read verse 10? The people are stood in exile. The letter from Jeremiah is being read out, and everyone's going, oh, it's wonderful. The problem is 10 comes before 11. So 11, no one put that on their fridge because it just followed verse 10. It says, when 70 years are complete, I will come to you. But don't worry. I know the plans I have for you. Well, you can do it. I'm in exile. I want to hear that next week we're booking flights. But you're telling me I'm 30 years old. I'm not that bad at maths. 30 in 70. I'll be 100? Verse 11. Verse 11. Verse 11. Verse 11. Verse 11. So, God, you're saying I'm going to die in exile? And then what are you telling me? Oh, I know the plans I've got for you. Wow, we've got so much to learn about God, haven't we? And if we just allow those, those things to wash over us, it just relaxes us. God's timing is perfect. It's not mine, it's not yours, but it's perfect. It's God's little one. And if it, even if it doesn't fit in with Nigel White's coffee and his packed schedule, it's still the best thing for Nigel White. But don't tell him I said that because I do want my coffee on time. It really is. Earthquake, verse seven. You have to understand the context here. I will shake all nations. 
and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The context of earthquake there is there were no geologists at the time. Okay, so when we hear this earthquake, ah, I know what that is. That's two tectonic plates, and they judge and they cause an earthquake and tsunami. No, no, no. There weren't any geologists back then, or there may not even be a geologist, maybe someone else, sorry. But in those days, an earthquake meant God is moving. So the context here. I will shake all nations. And then what is desired by all nations will come. This is an interesting one, because traditionally, the desire of all nations not the desired, how it was translated before, the desire of all nations was considered to be a messianic promise. So saying the desired of all nations was Jesus. Now, he is the desired of all nations. Please don't throw me out and not invite me back. I understand that, but that's not what is meant here. Sorry to say that. What all nations desire, the treasures of all nations shall come in. That's what it's talking about. What is it saying? Well, what do people want? Look at the next verse. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Everything you have, everything you are, everything you ever will be, everything you'll ever have is God's. And what's amazing is that goes for everyone. It goes for Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Solomon, Cyrus, Darius, and Nigel White. Whether we acknowledge it or not, that's the important thing, you see. When we sing praises to God before the talk, it's wonderful where we lift God up, but please don't ever think that God is only lifted up when you choose to lift him up. He's already up there. It's our decision, our privilege to decide whether to join in with that. So Jeff Bezos and all these people, I'm not, I'm not sorry, I must be rude. I'm not calling into question them. I'm just saying, however rich they think they are, and whenever, what is it, what did he do this, this week, Elon Musk? Didn't he send out a Twitter poll as to whether he should sell 10% of his shares, which was 12.1 billion or 1.21 billion? I can't remember the numbers exactly. But he decided, I'll let you decide whether I should sell. But he's not going to give you the money, don't worry. He's still going to make the 12 billion, but you decide whether I'll sell. No, 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 no. God decides. God decides. Whether we choose to worship him, whether we choose to give our money to him and our time and our talents, they're all his anyway. We think we are much bigger than we actually are. And then verse 9, the wonderful the beautiful promise at the end of this passage. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. Wow. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. You see, it's not about the size of the temple. It's about the size of the God it points to. It's not about the size of the signpost, as long as it's big enough to see. A signpost can read, I mean, there's some great towns, little villages in, in Dorset. Piddle Trentide, Puddle Town, and then the slightly big ones like London. But it doesn't matter, does it? As long as the signpost is big enough to read, it's about who or what the signpost is pointing to. Why does Jesus say all you need is faith as small as a mustard seed? Because it's not about you, it's about the God you believe in. Let me ask you a very simple question, and this is very un American, and I should say becoming more and more un British. Because the theory these days is if you have faith in anything, that's fine. If you come to a river that is frozen over, is the thickness of the ice important or the bravado or the, uh, the enthusiasm under which you go across that river? Which will get you to the other side? You see, we're told it doesn't matter if there's any ice anyway. You're not going to get wet. 
Because if I believe it's right, it's all right. And Jesus says, faith as small as a mustard seed. You may be tiptoeing across that river. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not entirely sure. You'll get to the other side. Why? Because you put your trust in the ice that was thick enough to get you over. It's not about you. It's not about your resources. It's not about your abilities. It's not about your talents. It's about the God you worship. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. As the people are strong in God and work for God and are not afraid of their surroundings, but rather fear or respect God. In this place, I will grant peace. It's amazing, isn't it? You see, we sort of, we, we get the idea that God is really powerful and big and, and owns everything and owns the world because he made it for the sake of me, of course. Uh, but, but did you notice he's also the only one who can actually grant peace? And that's something that I think people are looking for these days. In the last 18 months has not been peaceful for the world, has it? And what's scary is I suddenly think, oh, things are getting back to normal. I'm on the tube, I'm on the train, I'm driving to meetings. Oh, that's all right. And I forget that there are still millions, if not billions of people who haven't even had one jack yet. And there are some countries who are where we were last winter. But who cares? I'm all right. That's an aside. That would be another sermon. But we have to pray about what we should do in reaction to the policies that our government makes and so on. For our own benefit, I, I must admit, I'm not mocking the government. I know a lot of people not the government, but again, that's even another sermon. But there we go. There's three in one. God says to you and those in your circle, I will grant peace. We need to grab that. We need to gain God's presence. We need to gain real prosperity. We need to gain his peace. And we do that by aligning our one priority to worshipping him and putting him in the place he should be. And so I'm not actually necessarily saying that verse 9 is a promise for Karn Evangelical Church. I'm not prophesying over you that, ta-da, Karn Evangelical Church, the glory of this present house will be great for the glory of the former house. I, 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 God hasn't told me to say that. Please, I'm reading that from the Bible. But what I am saying is the same God who was worshipped in the former temple and in the temple when it was rebuilt in 500 BC and in Karni Evangelical Church, it is the same God. And he is able to do the same things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you do meet us where we need to be met, but you don't leave us there. I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, help me to understand what real prosperity is and what I hanker after other things that I will define as prosperity. Lord, I pray that you would bring me back to knowing that your presence with me is what real prosperity is. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.